for Foslo. Um, can you unmute your mic? Okay, sorry. I... Okay, so um, it's my privilege to to introduce our speaker. But before I do that, um, I want to int introduce um, or ask the head of the GSA, Professor Mark Raymond, um, to introduce the postgraduate diploma in architectural management program, which the GSA will introduce uh, from 2023 onwards. Okay, thank you, Christo, and welcome everybody. Um, we're looking forward to this evening's um, talk by um, Antonio Alves. Um, Christo, as you know, manages the professional practice program at the GSA, which is part of our master's program that um, prepares graduates for professional practice and uh, the skills that they'll require for that. And, and this evening's lecture uh, by Anthony uh, is the first of a number of lectures where we will have architects talking about how they practice, how they, how they do what they do. Um, and we think it's important um, for students at the school to engage and to start understanding the different modes and ways through which they will practice. So um, th this series intends to address that by um, allowing architects to showcase their processes of working and their approaches to the work and how they started. And Christo has developed over the last couple of years a program, uh, a postgraduate diploma in architectural management. It's loosely modeled on programs that run different places in the world. In the UK, um, there are programs that are uh, offered at this level. And what they do is they provide an education uh, in the those aspects of, of architecture that are not specifically to do with design. Um, it's a program that will look at the context for architectural practice, who are the different players um, that, who, whose work intersects with those of architects, the different agencies, the different regulatory bodies, how the design process is managed from a management perspective, how the process of design takes place, engagement with clients, uh, engagement of the process of design, and then also the management of construction, how the process of construction takes place in relation to the process of design. And the, the, the course will also look at uh, entrepreneurship, um, it will look at property development, it will look at the different spheres or realms of practice in which architects engage in their professional lives in the, in the more kind of orthodox modes of, of practice. Uh, and in many ways, it's it's a program that um, potentially could lead or become a very, very useful vehicle towards the professional qualification examination. But it's also a qualification that would be very useful for anybody who's working with uh, architects or in the process of design who wants to understand more about that process, how it operates and how those skills and how that knowledge is applied um, in the construct in the design and construction of buildings. Now. Um, it's going to be launched next year and if anybody listening in on this uh, event is interested in finding more information about it we're going to post in the chat um, the name of the program and also contact details for Adeshni Reddy who is the academic administration manager at the GSA and if you email Adeshni she can provide you with more details and we will be hosting a couple of events in the coming months to introduce anybody that's interested in the program um, to the nature of the program, the, the the scope of it, what it covers, and give them an idea uh, of what they will be up against. It's 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 also what is also interesting about it is it's going to be offered online, so you will be able to do this remotely. You don't have to be in Johannesburg. Um, you could be anywhere in the world for that matter, but um, that's one of the advantages of it. And it can it's also a program that can be undertaken over two years. So we're looking forward um, to hearing any back from anybody who's interested in that um, and uh, to, to launching that program next year. So I look forward to hearing from you all on that. So now I'm going to hand you back over to Christo. And Christo is going to introduce this evening's uh, practitioner, Anthony Relevitz, who, as you know, is a, a founder, I believe, and a partner at uh, Paragon. And he's going to talk about uh, his professional life, his experience, how he came to practice, and the sort of work he's involved in. Thanks very much, Christo. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Raymond. Um, as Professor Raymond said, the, the the idea with this lecture series on the, the Tuesday evening lecture series, uh, which we titled Ways of Working, is to feature um, the way or to, to feature 
prominent practitioners and for them to uh, talk about the way in which they they practice, um, how they manage the process, how they get work, etc. Rather than focus on the design of their buildings, um, even though that in, um, invariably will come into it. So the the first um, speaker that we that we have, Anthony Relevitz, as we've already mentioned, um, he completed his BOC in 1990 and his MBA in 1994 at the University of the Witwatersrand, um, specializing in property finance. He has been in private practice since 1996 and co-founded Paragon Architects PTY Limited in October 1997 with Henning Rasmus. In 2013, Anthony formed Paragon Architects South Africa with Henning Rasmus and Tulani Sebande. His experience as property financier at uh, Standard Bank has offered him valuable insight into the structured project finance, the imperatives for budgetary controls and accountability towards clients and project stakeholders. Anthony's core expertise is as design director and project principal on complex and fast track projects that rely on cost engineering and workshops construction solutions. He is committed to driving leadership in innovation and his projects have pioneered the use of various material systems, including unitized panels, double glazed units and paper thin stone tiles. Anthony has the ability to work flexibly uh, in any type of team constellation and as a good communicator um, he adds value to, to team-based developmental processes. Uh, this consultative approach has benefited the company as it continues to grow. In addition, he is committed to mentoring, working with students at Paragon and serving time as an external examiner. And may I just add in the end that Anthony uh, agreed to this presentation immediately when I met, when I when, um, asked him uh, to present us. So, um, Anthony, thank you very much uh, for agreeing. And with that, I hand the, the the screen over to you. Thanks, Christo. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for taking the time out uh, to join us in this series. Um, I'm just going to swap over to the presentation mode on the screen. One second. OK, can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Excellent. OK, thanks. So I'm going to run through. I think Krista asked us just to show three projects and then there's a series of questions. I've just added in a series of buildings before I get to those three presentations, and I'm going to go through them very quickly because they have been quite formative in the way our practice has evolved. And I'll just run through that um, and explain how that works. Um, I then got three projects I'd like to discuss in more detail. One of them is a full presentation, so you can actually see that when we do a presentation to a client, what's entailed in terms of pitching for work. And then there's a series of questions which I will then answer. Um, just please excuse my screen. There's something wrong in the way that the slides are tran transitioning. And so um, for the first part of the presentation, you're going to see uh, on the left hand side all the slides, uh, which eventually um, I'll, I'll go into slide mode later on. So there were two pivotal buildings in um, defining our practice where we started to become a more dominant practice. The first was uh, Norton Rose and the second one was a building called Afgri. Um, it's the first time we really started experimenting with the form of a building and you can see that this building in terms of its facades it doesn't have a typical um, spandrel and window layout on the, on the gable edges. The building's are designed so that the skins of the buildings, you can't really tell where the windows are. And then the building becomes more of a sculptural kind of form. This is actually quite a small building. Um, our client wanted an iconic building. And so what we did was we took a building 
made two towers out of it, elevated one tower taller than the other, so it looked like it was more dominant. And then we played with the massing of the facades so that you couldn't pick up where the windows and the floor plates were in the patterning of the facade. The next building, which had the same kind of influence on our practice, they were built almost at the same time, it was a building for AFPI, which is really the farmers' cooperative. And we used a lot of concrete shells. And in order to make the building seem plasticized, we used broken tiles. Um, it was an incredibly cheap way of, of doing a building. I think the tiles cost, I think, 100 Rand, and they cost 200 Rand to lay and break on the facade. And so we were able to start to develop an architectural typology where we started to free up the form, okay, in terms of the materiality that we were using. And so those two buildings were quite pivotal in experimenting with getting away from traditional materials and forms and liberating us and allowing us to design more sculptural kind of architecture. Um, we did a building in, in Park Town North, um, BDO, and really here we started exper experimenting with finishes and mass. So you can see that in terms of the brickwork, in order to make the building look like a mass, we actually clad the building on the soffit. And you can see that in South Africa, um, that the concrete work is not really of a high quality. And so we learned to introduce a texture to the materiality um, in order to get away from the detail of, of pure uh, pristine concrete work. And that also liberated us to actually start playing with concrete as a material without an expectation that it was going to be um, pristine. This is a original building we designed for Alexander Forbes. Once again, it's playing with the forms of materiality. So using software. So software is integral to creating all these forms, working with NURBS, NURBS um, using a lot of Rhino um, nowadays. In those days, it was harder. We we're using AutoCAD and really just creating shells of the building by looking at what materials we can um, bend and manipulate in order to create the kind of forms that we want to make. And here we used a material called Rhino and Zinc in the facade. Um, this was the actual building that was built, but still using the same kind of materials. The next pivotal building for us is really Sasol. Um, it's a very complica complicated building. The facade is really driven by the analysis of the sun shading on the facade. So where a building is facing south, um, the blue, which is the clear glass, uh, goes from floor to ceiling with a very thin spandrel section. And as the building orientates towards the west, um, you can see that it starts to get the facade patterns start to change. So the facade of this building wasn't driven by an aesthetic, it was driven by the building's response and orientation to, to the sun. Uh, just some internal views to show um, how one comes up from the basement of the building, and then some of the internal volumes within the building itself, and how the bridge links are designed to span through the volumes. If you look at, up at the top, you can see the skylights. They look quite one-dimensional, and as you go up, into the building, you can see they become quite cloud-like. And when you walk across the uppermost bridges, you've got these translucent clouds that you almost uh, transition between. Um, this is really the bathrooms of Cecil, they're massive. And so in order to create the illusion of the building being smaller or more intimate, we kind of broke up the basins and and manipulate the wall scape so that you had a more intimate space in, that, in the bathrooms. Um, the next real pivotal buildings that we did was 140 West Street, and we did um, Alice Lane. They're both buildings for lawyers, and you can see that the shape of the building is quite different to our typical buildings because these buildings are kind of driven by office layouts, um, cellular offices. We try to have yeah, very thin plates. And we try to maximize the amount of light uh, into the floor plates. And so you have two buildings of a similar function um, with a very similar kind of plan. Uh, Creative Council was a building that we I really enjoyed designing. It's um, also this whole thing about learning how to manipulate materials so that you can have the flexibility uh, to create form and volume and sculptural. I mean, these buildings really have like a sculptural presence when you stand 
uh, in a scale that's in almost a eight metre high space. We at Paragon, I think we're known more for our large commercial buildings. In the last three or four years, we've been trying very hard to explore other typologies. This building is designed by Devil Feltzman um, in our practice, and it was built in Swaziland, and all he had available to him was this one concrete block. And um, just through design, he basically used the block to create these skins, and where those blocks project, they either lights or they become elements for planting in. And I was very proud of this building because it really reflects our intention around trying to make the most out of the opportunities and materials given to us as a practice. Um, even to the extent of looking at garden walls for clients uh, on their properties. So actually, even a simple wall to look at the ethos of how do we create something that is dynamic and powerful and uh, different for our clients. This client, we convinced them to give up space on the street and so they gave up parts of their garden um, so that they could get back to the streetscape on the other side. The three projects I, I want to talk about really, um, first is Caterpillar. So this is a building that you can see when you travel on the uh, R24 just before you get to the airport. Um, it was a competition. Um, they had an existing building, which you can see uh, in the center of the page. And then really they had, they wanted us to design a showroom which had um, secondhand vehicles, where it says plant showroom, and then use plant showroom is actually for the new building, for the new um, equipment. Um, the plant showroom is actually external, and the elements on the left, or the space on the left is actually um, enclosed. And then on the upper level, they've got service offices um, on a mezzanine level above. So this was really, it was a competition. Um, and I think we, we won it because the client felt that as an industrial building, we were able to, because we had experimented with materials before, we were able to create a very, for the same money and for the same um, time, we were able to create something that they believed was special and would be very powerful in representing them as a, as, as a business. And this is really how the building uh, manifested. So on the left hand side, you can see all the vehicles Those are second hand vehicles. And then you have the showroom on the right hand side. Um, those glass doors are the tallest vertically lifting glass doors in the world. They are almost, um, I think, nine or 10 meters high. And you push a button and the whole facade lifts up to expose the vehicles inside. Um, just in terms of materiality, the budgets are very tight in this building, and so just using drywall in a creative way to create form, uh, we're able to create and enhance the quality of the internal spaces. So these are very budget-driven buildings, and by learning to manipulate materials, you're able to really get on, on top of, of expressing your form. This is really what the showroom looks like inside. So a person standing next to that wheel would go, if they were tall, they would stand, they would go up to about the top of the yellow hub on the wheel itself. I just want to run th through the kind of presentations that we would put together. WPP um, is one of the largest ad agencies in the world. They have 17 different divisions within WPP. And this is just ready to show you we get, we've got about three weeks to put this presentation together from concept to design. Um, this is the process that we go through. So this is the actual presentation that we use to win this competition. Um, so it starts off with this animation, which really looks at all the divisions within the organization. And then we start to look at how we can connect people or the different divisions within the organization most effectively. We align all the different divisions and we insert a core which is really the lifts and the toilet cores. And then we basically link them with bridges and read it. That is how, for us, we came to design this building. It was driven by the optimum efficiency for a commercial business to operate. Um, 
the building has um, two and a half basements. It sits on, um, this is Main Road, this is Bryston Drive. Um, we want to activate this edge, although it's it's really not an, a very intense urban environment. We basically inserted a street um, at the back of the building over here. We inserted the boardrooms, the street cafes, and the multifunction boardrooms separate from the building itself, leading activating on the street edges. We have a central core in the building over here. Um, this side of the building is connected as a single unit. Um, and so the bridge links internally are within a glazed skin. Um, on the other side, we have a, actually a pedestrian street. And the building, this building is connected to this building by a series of exposed bridges. And that way we're able to let the gardens run through the building and the landscaping and create an environment which is much more engaging. Um, central to this is what we call the treehouse. The treehouse contains all the social spaces and all the co-working spaces, and they come off the central core over here. So because of COVID, in order to get people back into the office, um, our clients are having to offer more um, than just an office working environment. They have to entice people uh, back into a working space, and, and the only way to do that is to enhance uh, their working environment um, and enhance and to, and, to, and to use the building as a cultural generator. So this central treehouse here contains all the shared functions and then you have the typical floor plates in the pink. Uh, from a lifestyle point of view, the site has fantastic views, so we converted the roof into gardens and we've obviously created a building which has maximized north and south facades, min minimizing east and west exposure and also maximizing the views from the building itself. The client is very concerned about how to phase the building. So one option was to build phase one and then add phase two on. The other option was to build the light blue buildings first and then add the blue building behind. And because those bridges were external, we were able to, these bridges connecting this building here were external. We were able to link the building in a, in a post um, functional space in phase two. So this is a section through the center of the building. You can see that the cores over here, we've introduced all the social spaces, we call it the tree house, and all the co-working spaces into that central core. Um, the building's being terraced, so if this is north, uh, the buildings get taller and let light into um, the building, maximize light into the actual plates. Um, these two buildings are linked by a central atrium, and these two buildings are linked by a series of open bridges. And that's just the ground plane. So the parking, from the parking, you come directly uh, into the building. We have a central street that runs through, and we've taken some of the functions like boardrooms and coffee shops, externalized it, and activated them on the street. So the view from the corner, this is a view from the corner of, of Main and Branson Drive. You can see the pods that have been separated out from the building. Um, these buildings are very cost effective, so you can see we use the low brickwork in the facades, minimizing the glass, but you're really just ex exploring, utilizing edges of the slab edges as part of the design and putting that slab edge in and out of the facade. So this is a very competitive environment. We need to design the best buildings for our clients, both aesthetically, um, culturally, and functionally, um, all within the same parameters of our competitors, which are really driving, it's all driven by rental. So if you can't get the rental right, it doesn't matter what your building looks like, you're never gonna build it. This is a view from Main Street. You can see the external pods that we pulled out of the building, and then the roof of those buildings are converted to gardens, which link back into the building behind. So here you can see the, the roof terraces, and you can see the bridge links back and that straddles over the central street. These two buildings are linked by the central atrium, and then this becomes an open street, which are linked by a series of bridges between the two buildings. So if we stood at the main entrance over here and looked at the building, that's the first slide. And then if you stood at, on the other side of the atrium, looking out of the view, um, this is what you'll see. This is the entrance view. And this is, if you stood on the stairs, the internal, or, internal auditorium forms an external atrium space 
um, and an external auditorium um, and amphitheater for the building. So in order to um, pull people into the building, you have the central, it's from a cultural point of view, you have the central lifts over here. On every single floor, you've got a social space and these spaces change on every floor. They change in position, the aesthetics change so that if you're in the building, you're encouraging people to go from say the first floor to the fifth floor because the experiences are different and none of the spaces are repeated. So there are cultural generators in these spaces which really are, some, some zones are quiet, some are very active and social. And so the building can be a generator for driving culture. And then we have a series of co-working spaces so that people can come off the floor plates and work together in a co-working space, almost, almost like Workshop 17 or, or WeWork, but we're now incorporating that into the actual space itself. And then off the bridge links, we've got the pink areas, which are touchdown areas for the various floor plates itself. And then on the roof, um, we converted that into a lifestyle space. So on the lower roof, you have the canteen. On the upper level of that, you have a place to grow vegetables um, for the kitchens below. And that's linked across to a meditation garden over here. And then on the back of the highest building, we have a meadow, which has a screen that comes up so people can sit on the grass and look at movies at night. Or if they have showings and launches for the ad agencies, they can do it in the space. People can come up and work on the roof in an environment. We've called that area the glades. It's really a forested environment with built-in seats in the planters. And then they just have a beach bar area on the roof as well. So this is really, I'll just run through some of those with you. So this is the meditation space. So you can come up and work in this environment. Um, you can come and sit up here where we're growing the veggies for the kitchen. Uh, this is the beach area. So you can actually sit in a cabana um, or at a bar area. This is the glade, so you can sit in forested areas amongst trees um, and work in a very calm environment with views. And then there's the meadow, which is really just this glass, grassy knob that runs through. This is just a fly through of the building. So this is what you would be expected to submit to a client. Uh, the design process is about, let's just say, three weeks. And um, this is what's required to be competitive. So here's a view over the pods into the street. The bridge links you can see linking the roofs back to um, the gardens that span between the spaces. And then on the ground floor, all these spaces open up into these gardens. And above you can see the bridge links. So this view will now go back towards the entrance of the building. And we cut these into short slices so that we can use them in the presentation themselves. So in the larger presentation, we would talk through all these sections that are spliced. And at the end, we splice them all together so you can see the kitchen, the roof garden, and then looking back at the moment towards the meadow, uh, the glades, and the beach area. So that would be a typical presentation. So I want to run through, um, we've, I've been wanting to do houses for a long time. I have been really missing the connection of, of, of doing houses. So this is a house that we, we finished uh, about three years ago. Um, it's a panhandle site, so here's the forecourt. I'm going to run through this very quickly. Uh, this is the kitchen living area. This is the bedroom areas on the ground floor, so the house is inverted. The children's bedrooms are over, over here. And the main bedroom wing is over here with this unforested garden on the north. And the whole idea about this house is really that this house is based around a central courtyard. And all the rooms open up either into the courtyard. And these external spaces are all external rooms that the house opens up into. So the doors will slide away. Um, this is the upper level. So upstairs you've got a lounge and TV area the kitchen below it. You've got the central courtyard. These are open gardens on the upper level. So the, the grass areas are elevated onto the first floor and there's a swimming pool on the first floor. So it maximizes 
amount of light that you can get. There's a fire pit, a dining area, and an exercise area on the other side. Um, just a section through the building um, showing the kitchen area with a lounge above it. Uh, this slab over here is suspended off post tension beams above. And this green wall, which I'll show you pictures of, has got post tension um, slabs and beams so that we can get these massive long spans and carry huge loads. So this is the entrance to the house. Um, looking very much at textures and finishes and materials. Um, this is an aluminium slat, uh, which gives a sense of being quite earthy. These post tension building has post tension beams, which allow for these 24 meter spans and the doors can slide away. So the whole building starts to look open. And then basically this area over here with the, where this water feature is, has been raised by 800 mils. So we imported fill to the site. So the relationship between the water and your internal spaces, um, the water was at eye height, not at the ground level. Internally, you've got a green wall and that green wall hangs down. So when you slide the doors away, you have this green uh, curtain almost separating out the inside and the outside of the building. As if you're looking down onto the, the forecourt and the entrance of the building, uh, you can see that notionally the tracks of how the vehicles move are indicated in the driveways, which is made out of slate. And then in between that, there's really just gravel infill. There's a detail of it. Uh, coming to the house, you've just got a staircase going up. Um, you can see the post tension beams here, these massive long spans. So we're really using corporate technology, okay, in a um, domestic environment. There's a skylight that opens up over the top of the house here, which is a single skylight, which is 24, 20 meters long. It's got an internal green wall that runs through the building, and that carries about three and a half tons of soil in the mid span with these massive long post tension beams. This long term post tension beam has a 90 millimeter um, steel rod, and that holds up this whole slab over here. So really just designing a house which is very light and there's no columns inside the house. The view of the kitchen. And then from the patio, looking back towards the kitchen and the entrance where we're standing in the forecourt. And behind me is the main courtyard of the building, which we look at now. Um, and then really just creating light into the patio by creating this very deep, um, skylights that get light through. Um, this is standing in the central courtyard. Um, like I said, the pool's on the first floor. It's got these skylights really just lets light down into the dining area below. And that's looking back through the same courtyard. Um, the staircase takes you to the roof, um, which is almost like a tree house. And then we've designed these handrails to be succulent planters. Um, as you come up the staircase. As a view of the upper deck, you can see a fire pit in the background, a dining table over here. And so really the house has been elevated uh, to really be amongst the trees within the city. Looking back from the tree house towards the house, you can see the green wall over here. You can see these large spans where all the doors open up without any columns. And then the bedroom over here also has an external garden. So that's just a view of the green wall, which hangs down to the floor below. And here's that rod that holds up this whole floor plate, okay, which is suspended on this very large post tension beam. Here's the guest room next door. And that's a view really of a garden. You push a button, the skylight comes in and closes the roof off. Otherwise you have a garden out in nature on the first floor of the building. If you come across to the northern portion of the building where the main bedroom is, once again, you can see these massive sections of the house that can open up. Um, also because of these post tension beams and you're able to really just create a, a space which is integrated between the inside and the outside of the building. That's really the bathroom. It opens up on three sides. And it looks into a central courtyard over here or out into the garden on the other side. And that's an aerial view of looking down into that central courtyard uh, with a swimming pool below.
Right, and that's really um, about our practice and what we've been up to. Um, so I graduated from uh, architecture in 1989. I, um, in my final year of architecture, my thesis, I woke up one morning and I had, I couldn't see, I, I, I became blind. Um, that was in, just before I started my thesis year. Um, and it took about three months for my vision uh, to come back partially. My eyesight never came back completely. And at the time, they were worried that, the doctors were worried that I had a degenerative disease so that as I, as I got older, my eyes would get worse. And so as I was writing, going through my thesis year, I had this anxiety about having to get other skills in case I went blind. So I, I basically went to work for Star Foster for a year and got my, my degree and, and graduated got, and, and became a, a architect. And then I had, a, I had to take five years, I had a five year window to determine whether my eyesight would ever come back or would continue to degenerate. So I went and did an MBA and then I went to work for Standard Bank for two years in their property finance division. And after five years of being not in architecture and waiting to see whether my eyes would st were stable, uh, luckily after a five year period, my eyes were deemed to be uh, stable and I could go back to architecture. So the, uh, exactly after five years the, to the day I left the bank and uh, went and opened a practice. And um, that was on a Friday, and then I got a call saying they had two clients wanted, and was I interested? And obviously, I was very excited. And I said yes. I'd love to meet them. I said I need about two weeks so I could get established. I get computers. I could get business cards. I could even get a name. I didn't even have a name for a business. So what happened was. Um, so I'm going to just, sorry, one second. So what happened was um, they said to me, no, you, you, these clients are leaving on Wednesday and you have to be in, in a position to see them. So my father owned a furnished, secondhand furniture company and I had a very large room at my house. So I phoned my father, I designed a layout and on Monday morning, um, the secondhand furniture arrived and I set up a false office. And then I needed people to to fill that office, and so I phoned my friend Gary Lowe, who was, we had a practice, and I offered to share the work with him if we got it. And um, he said he would uh, send his staff, and he would come across on um, the Tuesday morning, and uh, pretend that we had an office. Um, we then on, we looked up what the luckiest colours were for doing business in China which was gold and red and white, and we printed business cards and we made up a name for our business uh, called Oral Roberts Low Architects. And we really only printed five business cards, so if we needed more, we, we would have been in trouble. And the next morning uh, on the Tuesday, um, these two clients arrived, we introduced ourselves to them. They walked into the office, there were people sitting at tables and at desks and little kiosks. And they all turned their computers away from from the view um, of the clients, and they weren't even on. The clients came and they sat down with us. Um, they briefed us. We said we'd get back to them a few days later. Um, and then they, after about an hour and a half, they left. And um, my then Gary's staff left. They went back to Gary's office. And then the guys from my dad's office uh, from his company needed the furniture, they all came down, they collected them, and in about an hour and a half after we had met with the clients, there was nothing left in the room. And that is how we really got our first client. Um, that was before Paragon existed. Um, that was, I started a business with Gary and we worked in shared offices together. So, the way that we, that's how we landed our first appointment, but the way that we really got our first big job is because I'd worked at the bank and I had given a, and worked with people in terms of finance. Um, I basically went back to those clients who I was funding and asked them if they would give me work. 
So I had a client from a company called Zemprop, which was really one of the bigger architectural, uh, one of the larger development companies in, in South Africa. And he saw me as a banker. So he said to me, look, I'm not going to give you any work until you, I'm not going to be a guinea pig. You need to go and get other work from other clients. And then I'll give you some decent work. At that time, me and Henning had started Paragon Architects. And um, we were invited to enter a competition at Noah's Arch. So at Noah's Arch, in the first phase, they gave many of the sites away to architects under the age of 35. So all those small multiple buildings built around the courtyards, um, they were given to, to young architects. And there were three architects per land parcel we had to compete. After we uh, had competed, uh, we put in our entry, me and Henning, and we won our land parcel. And the minute I heard that we had won, I phoned this, our first client. And I said to him, Rodney, I've got a building with a lift. He said to me, how many lifts and how tall? I said, there are four lifts and the building's eight stories high. And he said to me, okay, you can come and see me on Monday. And that's really how we landed our first proper client. Um, in terms of marketing, um, architecture, commercial architecture is very interesting. There are only maybe 20 dominant commercial um, developers uh, that control about 80% of the market. So unlike houses where you have to keep a marketing out into through magazines or where you have to start marketing uh, by word of mouth, if you focus on the 20 most dominant developers, Redefine or GrowthPoint or Abland or Zemprop, you would be very exposed to most of the commercial work happening. And so it's quite an easy place to grow a business because A, you don't have to, you can focus on relationships with very specific clients. And you can also, um, you don't have to advertise um, a huge amount. And if you're very good or if you're able to keep your clients, you can build, you can go and get one client, like our first client was Zemprop. And once you have established a long-term relationship with them, and now we've been working with Zemprop for nearly 25 years, um, after the first year or two when you developed a relationship and you're delivering, you can go and see Redefine, and then you can go and see Growth Point, and slowly, slowly over time, you start to develop um, relationships, and they're very key relationships with your clients. And so that's really how um, we built our practice. It was person-to-person -person relationships in a very, very focused kind of space. One of the downsides of that as a process is that as we get older, and as our clients get uh, older, most of our clients are quite successful by now. And so we start to find that that strategy for us has, or it has limitations. So as our clients are getting to their late 50s and their early 60s, they're looking to retire and we're looking to sustain our practice going forward. And so we've had to start that whole cycle again. So you're never in a place where you establish a business and you can sit back and just um, I think that everything is sorted. You, you're on a continuous process of managing your relationships, looking for younger clients that are up and coming um, so that you can engage with them and that your practice remains uh, relevant. So that's really how we market. We, we also get a lot of marketing through magazines. Um, so people would come to us and look at our buildings and say, can we publish? And um, that's been a major way of getting exposed and through the internet. Um, and then I suppose this kind of engagement with the universities, um, either through talks like this or really through um, engaging with being an external examiner or, or creating theses is fantastic for our business. We get exposure to students and students really start to get a sense of who we are as a practice as well. Um, in terms of our structure, Paragon is siloed into three different businesses. There's PASA, which is um, one of our businesses that mainly does governmental work. Um, then there's Paragon Architects, which does a lot of our commercial, the kind of work I've shown you earlier, a range from residential, commercial, <laughs> we do hotels, we do industrial buildings. And then we've got a, build, a business called Paragon Interface, which really does um, the interiors for our buildings. 
And it's actually quite amazing how often um, we pick up work through our interiors practice or our interiors practice picks up work through our architectural practice. And really what's important is that um, when we design buildings, we look at the interiors all the time so that um, when it comes to talking to clients about our interiors, we already have the building set up so that our interior practice can maximize its efficiency and, and try to get the work. Um, we were asked, how does our practice work from a financial point of view? So in all practices, especially commercial practices, one has to really manage one's costs very carefully. Um, when we pitch on a job, our fees can be anywhere between 4% uh, to about 4.5% on large jobs. And that gives you a finite pot of money. What we then do is we look at the resourcing on that job and we allocate each work package. So whether it's doors or window schedules, um, GAs, we allocate a number of man hours to that process and the amount, amount of people that we need to run the job as a whole. So all those packages are added up and broken up into hours. And then we use what is called an ERP system, which really is a system that takes your timesheets that people fill in. It looks at your accounting system and it ties the whole system together. So we have, an ex we have a plan when the job starts to run and we look at what we should spend on the job and what our profits should be. And then month by month, as the timesheets come in, we can check whether the work is, whether we're up to date in terms of the work schedules and where we're sitting in terms of our expected expenditure. And it's an incredibly powerful tool. This, this tool also tells us, if you look at all the people in our business, we can see it allocates colors to their names. So if a person's working at an excessive capacity, his name comes up red. If they're working in, if they're underutilized, then they'll come up green. And if people are correctly utilized, they'll come up in blue. That's it. That's really in a perfect world. Um, the process is much more chaotic than that, but at least the, these ERP systems that we're using um, give us a guide and manage to help us resource properly and to make sure that our expenditure and our profits are maintained throughout the process of how long a job runs. So if, if someone says to you, um, we do a job like Sassel and you earn, say, 30 or 40 million rands with the fees, it sounds like a, a fortune for, for, for a practitioner. If you take that and you divide that money over 36 months and you divide that into your overhead and the amount of people, say 10 people, that need to work on that job, um, you can quickly see that, although it sounds like a huge amount of money, that actually it can be very tight. And so every month you need to make sure that um, that you are keeping pace with what your expected expenditure is going to be. Um, otherwise, if you find out that you've spent all your money and you still have a few months to run in order to to finish the job, which could be a disaster. Um, in terms of the future, um, there's a huge at the moment change happening in in the economy and certainly before COVID, there was already an oversupply of, for example, office buildings in Johannesburg, and certainly in South Africa. And if your economy doesn't grow quick enough, I think that is really problematic. Um, and this has been substantially exacerbated by COVID. Um, and so many, many people, we already had a lot of vacant buildings and um, that's exacerbated by people now working partially at home. So, you know, out of that kind of space, one has to look and say, how do you turn a business around? And really, you need to look at other parts of the market for us. Um, so logistics has become a massive part of the market. Um, I think hotels are coming back. Residential buildings in certain cities like Cape Town are very buoyant. And so, Paragon over the last five or six years has really been diversifying our exposure to say commercial offices. And um, where we are busy doing commercial offices, we have to basically reinvent the way that people use them. 
And so when I show you the presentation earlier and you can see all that lifestyle stuff that's going to the buildings to entice people back in, that's really what organizations are having to do. They're going to have to create environments that are far greater than staying, far more enjoyable than staying at home. And architects are going to have to learn how to create spaces that, that generate those kind of, that are cultural generations, generators that are um, generators for efficiency and how people work together. So the opportunities in architecture vary all the time. It's like a commodity. And you might build a practice up that is primarily a commercial practice. I think that's, or, or a residential practice. I think my advice really would be that you need to diversify your skill set and um, you need to make sure that you can cover a wide variety of, of work so that you can mitigate against um, risk. The other advice I, I could give you is really that um, when you become an architect, maybe you need to, just like accountancy and law have started to change, um, maybe you need to get other skills. Um, and I think that's why this post-grad course that is being offered next year could be very good because um, having knowledge in property finance, having knowledge in development really enhances your skill set. And so if you have um, these additional skills when you engage with developers um, across the board from hotels to shopping centers to, to offices, um, you have so much more to, to offer them. And when you're designing your ability to value engineer the buildings uh, so you can have a vision of what a building should be. And if you have the skill set to actually manipulate the packages and the money on those jobs, you have a much higher chance of being successful in, in your work. And so we don't let the QSs just drive our process. We understand as Paragon um, that in order to realize our designs, we need to stay within certain parameters which are driven by rental. And it's up to us as the architects to make sure that we manage the costs and where the money goes. So having financial knowledge really empowers you to be a better designer and to actually realize your, your, your designs. So those are really, I think, where, where there are opportunities to further your skill set so that you can um, create a better chance of being successful uh, as a practitioner. Um, advice to young students or young graduates. Um, I know that people talk a lot about work-life balance, but architecture is incredibly difficult and complex field. You have to deal with legal issues, you have to deal with construction on site, you have to work with detailing materials, you have to deal with your clients and their budgets. That process takes probably probably 10 years before you have a real sense of control over that process. So my advice to young students is that when you graduate, you should really go work for big firms. They can give you the most exposure across a, the largest range of experience with really big budgets. And if you do that and you work hard um, and to acquire that knowledge, I think if you've acquired that knowledge by the time you're 35, you're in an incredibly strong position to choose whether you want to go back to doing residential work, whether you want to go into governmental work, but you've got a, a quiver of skills that you can deploy um, to realize any kind of architectural aspiration um, that you might have. So that when you graduate, those first few years of getting experience are critical. And the larger and the greater the responsibilities you can take on, and the harder you can work until you're 35, uh, to develop your skill set is key to your trajectory going forward. So we can see people who come to our practice um, that work really hard. They get they get small jobs to run on their own, and then those jobs get bigger. And by the time they're 35, they're running massive billion rand. We've had people of 28 running a billion rand job uh, in our office. Um, and then, you know, if they choose to leave us, they leave with a real strong sense of skills and we've had the benefit of, of having their talents in, in our practice. So that's really my advice, is to get skills quickly and to get a range of skills early. 
and then your work-life balance could come uh, once you've got those skills. Thanks, guys. That's really the presentation. I'm just going to switch on my screen. Yes. Thank you, Anthony. That was really um, thought-provoking and interesting. Um, at one, at uh, especially towards the the end, I think the advice which you shared with students is really important. So that brings us to an opportunity where people can ask questions. Sure. So if you have any questions, um, please uh, raise your hand and let's hear them. Um, just to add, you can also send your questions into the chat and we'll address them as we go through. OK, I see this one hand it doesn't show me who it is. Yes. OK, Simpiwe, I can see. Yes. Simpiwe, your question. Um, evening. Uh, Hi. Firstly, um, firstly, thanks a lot for your um, really inspiring and informative presentation. Thank you. Um, yeah, my question in this respect is you like looking at the post pandemic um, effect on the culture of office space and yeah. buildings and office spaces being victim of this um, post pandemic backlash on ch people's changes of work culture. Yeah. And you mentioned that you that there's a need to kind of entice people to come back to the office and yeah. sort of creating these cultural generators and like in the one building where you made these social spaces where no two are the same. Um, yeah. My question is what are sort of the principles and ideas one should take into consideration when um, creating these cultural generators also in an instance where you, maybe your idea of a cultural generator maybe might come in clash with say the budget or the some of the consider practical considerations of a client or a developer so so a client will give you a budget per area right so you'll know what each um we'll call it call them maybe pause areas right that run through a building um and it's our obligation to take that sum of money and go how do we spend each one in a different kind of way so there are massive benefits to this kind of of, of work so we sometimes create areas that are very social in a building, other areas that are very, very quiet and calming. So some, some areas are large tables where people can eat together. Other areas are uh, places where people can go find a refuge in the garden and eat alone and just be able to be in their own space. Um, we put in certain areas where there's gaming and foosballs and other areas where there's libraries. Other areas have got music, which is which you can sit under these domes and you can switch on and log in with your iPhone or your or your device and basically listen to your own music um, in, in a space that's that's in a public space, but still quiet. And so you have to invent these areas. And as a practice, that's what you've got to go. You've got to go. How do people what do we imagine people would love in a space? We also do surveys with with the staff and we get a sense of what their interests are and then we each building is different. So we look at where the general culture is going and we try and enhance the way we're designing to meet the culture of that, of that organization. The, the other benefit is that you don't always get these pause areas or these cultural areas exactly right. So by having a multiple range of them, uh, we statistically in a post, when you do a post analysis on the building, you can see which of those areas are frequented the most and which are the most popular. And they can see the ones that aren't and it doesn't cost you a huge amount of money if you've got say 15 or 16 areas in a building and two don't work you can in the next year's budget you can basically just fix those areas up and see um and you know use it to enhance the culture of the, of the building uh, does that answer the, the question um yes thanks a lot anthony sure Okay, Yufika, you're the next, you're second in line. Um, good evening, Anthony. Thank you for such a wonderful and inquisitive presentation. Um, I was really provoked by your last segment of your presentation where you're giving advice to young graduates. 
and um, speaking about expanding your skills, getting into firms that will really give you a, a great exposure and so forth. So my question is, how do we go about considering the current climate of COVID where um, a lot of graduates are struggling to find jobs, or let alone get into firms? How mm. do they go about expanding their skills? Do they then go into um, studying further so that they can um, acquire that financial knowledge that they would have got? But now it's also a challenge of um, being overqualified, for instance, because of the lack of experience and how saturated it is um, in relation to COVID, to the, the effects of COVID. Look, I, you know, I think timing is a big issue. You know, I think that if you if if you unfortunately graduate in a time where the economy is not buoyant, um, it's not a train smash, but it makes it certainly very difficult, and it can cost you a few years. And um, and and I think in a post COVID, I don't think it's really about COVID anymore. I think you know, for for example, our office is back uh, completely. I think. The issues for us really is that the economy is not growing and you know buildings and the profession grow when there's proper economic growth so you know i think for students that have a level of excellence i think young students that that really know rhino and revit and lumion and um you know can start to program um who can now to use 3d printers that now to use Photoshop and they're incredibly powerful. So over and above being a good architect or good student, I'm not sure whether the universities are driving those skill sets, but if we get someone who can't use Revit, we can't employ them. Okay, in our practice, we expect that when people come to our practice, okay, that they are, are, are very good at using all those tools because we give our students a huge amount of responsibility in our practice. We have a, a section where all the ideas are generated from directors in our business and they work directly with young students. So we work with third year students who work, work with recently post-grad students and that way they learn from us how buildings are put together and the logic. So when, and, we, and, and they bring huge amounts of skills and new ideas into our practice. So we have this very kind of collaborative kind of space that we work in. But if you haven't got those base skills, and, and those might not be in your curriculum, how to use Lumion or 3D Studio Max, um, certainly Rhino, um, you need to get those skills. It will. We often see beautiful portfolios, but the people aren't really um, difficult for a large corporate practice to work with people who haven't got those skills, over and above being a good architectural graduate. So that's really one way that you can mitigate that risk and find employment. The other one is to, if times are really bad, maybe go get some other skills like go go do a property development course or or something else that will enhance uh, your skill set. Um, but that's easier said than done. You know, it's it's a financial burden, and um, there's no guarantee ultimately that it's gonna it's gonna guarantee to get you work. Is, does that answer that question? Sorry. Yes, no, thank you. Really appreciate it. Sure. Um, we have a um, Andy, your question. Uh, evening. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you talked about the economy and uh, just the basic struggles that it's going through at this moment. Uh, what is your short term and long term goals and how did it change? After COVID, um, look, you know, I think that every, you know, the we at, like many of the large practices, where it's Buchetman, uh, Light, uh, GLH, uh, Star Foster, um, we had built very similar businesses um, where we had been working with property funds um, to stabilize our businesses. And what's happening in a post-COVID environment with a huge amount of excessive available office space or just space in general is that those funds are not building okay so our core clients um, are not active and effectively we've had to go out into the market 
and reinvent our businesses. And so the industrial market has always remained buoyant. I think that uh, in a post-COVID environment, hotels will be busy, logistics is busy. Um, in certain cities like Cape Town, residential apartments and houses are busy. So, you know, we've had to seek out and adapt. And the interesting thing is that, you know, it was very difficult for us when COVID first hit because it was a double whammy between the market and the REITs and an oversupply of space and then COVID where people aren't going to work in offices anymore. Um, but the irony is that when we come through this, um, the business, Paragon is a business that went into the recession, is going to come out of this recession because we've adapted our business um, to become a much stronger business with a much more diversified portfolio. So one of the reasons I showed you this, the range and scale of our work is just to say that, you know, there was a perception that Paragon only did large corporate buildings. And yet over the last four or five years, especially in the last three years, you can see the scale of the work we're doing and and we thriving. You know, we 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 we've we've never retrenched in the history of our business until um, COVID hit. It was the first time in 20 years. Um, but unlike many of our competitors, we, we never cut cut salaries. Um, and we've been very careful in trying to manage our business in the new size that we we become. So you have to be adaptive uh, in order to to survive. And that's the route that we took. Thank you. And then, uh, Dylan. Thank you. Evening, Anthony. Uh, thank you Hi, very much for the very insightful uh, talk. Um, my question is revolved around specifically as an inspiration for it, the WPP building that you elaborated on. Um, Part of my MDP this year is actually a collaboration project with Growth Point. Um, so we're trying to sort of cater to that vacant or vacant building problem that is obviously a post COVID or even sometimes a pre COVID problem. And we sort yeah. of trying to look at ways to solve this. Um, and one of the questions that sort of arose was um, I looked at different building facades in the area and sort of like you said if your building doesn't sort of cater to the needs of a person or look aesthetically pleasing sometimes it's not always catered to the client and it doesn't always bring in new tenants yeah. but something that was brought to my attention was certain office box or buildings are actually designed with a tenant in mind um, was that the case with this WPP building or is it a building that was designed by the initial client or the funder and developer of the project with a main tenant already being sold on the plans of it? Mm. Or is it a case of they aim to use the aesthetics and what the building looks like and what it, you know, what it brings to a community and a cultural aspect as the main driver for bringing in tenants? So, so we never design buildings for general tenants. We, we always, so Paragon is a business in, 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 in terms of offices, we always generally compete. Okay, so we compete, we form teams with, or we are co called to compete on behalf of developers. So redefine or furnace, for example, and say, or growth point, we have a, te there's a tenant in the market and we have to design a building for this tenant. Um, what we've done at Paragon is that we design buildings specifically, for example, for WPP, and we look at the culture and the lifestyle of that business, and we design around their culture so that we can sell that building to them. But in the case of having a recession, we're also designing buildings, on the other hand, to be subdivisible, to be broken up into smaller and smaller components. So if you take a massive building like Sassel or Alexander Forbes, We've designed that central core with those bridges that go out, allow for any other tenant. okay, if, if that tenant has to downsize and they've got a long-term lease with obligations, we're designing buildings to be called a future-proofing, okay, and we future-proof the buildings. Theoretically, we future-proof Alexander Forbes and Sassel, 
Um, the one is about eight years ago, and the other one is about five years ago. In the very layout and the floor plan, even though we had a dedicated tenant, and it's fascinating to see now that in a COVID environment, that the buildings that are leasing are the buildings that have been designed on that basis, where you can sublet the building even if the main tenant can't occupy the whole building. So we don't generally design buildings and put them into the market. We design a building and we find a tenant, we put them in, but if they can't sustain their lease, we need to the building needs to be adaptable to be able to be sublet to other piece people in a non-intrusive way. So that, that those are the drivers for us uh, in the market. Does that answer your question, Dino? It it does, and if you don't mind, um, may I just quickly have a follow up question with regards to that? Yeah. What yeah. do you think Paragon's actual solution might be then, um, in terms of existing office blocks that are already pre-designed for a uh, specific tenants in mind? How does so, one actually cope with the um, addition or the future proofing of an existing building? It depends on the scale. If you look at Discovery, for example, which is, if you look at, which are a series of donut buildings, for example, and they don't have any glass between the floors, and you can't walk across those floor plates, so you can't subdivide the plate. So if you want to lease a massive plate at, say, Discovery, that's problematic. You, you can only lease out a full floor. Um, if you wanted to rectify that, you would have to go back and put a glass skin on the inside of those open atriums. And you'd have to build bridges across the donuts of those atriums, um, maybe two bridges from a central point of the lifts. And if you do that, then you can start to break that floor plate down into multiple subletable spaces. Um, but clients choose sometimes not to do that because they have a tenant and they sign a very, very long lease and they're happy that to take that risk. So some of our clients do take that risk, others, won't take that risk and they'll plan ahead. With existing buildings, um, narrow buildings, funny enough, from the 70s, uh, with 12 meter floor plates are very good for conversion to residential. Um, and you can see that's happening in Fredman Drive. There are two or three buildings that already been converted to resi. Um, some buildings are converted to hotels with also the same kind of floor plate. So in Cape Town, you can see many buildings converted into to hotels or long stay apartments um, that were offices. So it depends on the building typology. The most difficult buildings are where you've got very deep floor plates uh, with no central light coming in. Uh, then those interventions that you have to do are massive in order to make those buildings work and maybe not viable actually. So each it's not a simple answer. The each building typology um, lends itself to a different kind of intervention to bring it back into market. But it's very complex. Um, it's a difficult process. But thank you. That's that's very informative and I appreciate the answer. Thank you. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> I think we, we also need to start wrapping up. So we, we won't be able to take more questions after tomorrow. So um, please, um, no more questions for the moment. We'll just work through the questions that we have. Um, so, uh, Graham, does does your answer your question answered? I haven't had a chance to um, ask my question yet. Okay, sorry, sorry, Graham, sorry. No, it's go for it, please. It's fun. Um, good evening, Anthony. Thanks so much for your time and presentation. Um, sure. My question follows previous um, information shared is I think um, addressing the pre-existing excess or surplus of office space in Johannesburg in particular, um, you know, post-COVID, how does one intervene with retrofitting those interventions you showed with, you know, communal spaces, ways to entice um, employees back to an office more on a full-time basis? Um, it tends to be that those kind of, parts of the budget and maybe landscaping are the first to be cut um, on a budget. So how does one, I suppose, dig your heels in with the client and, and get those um, points across that it's a must to have? You know, is there a, a, a source of information? Like you guys have data from previous projects, but for a, 
a first comer on that scene? How does one justify that part of the budget? Um, you know, this is a very difficult question because there are, there are developers and there, there are developers. So we there are developers out there that will try and take as much money back from a development as possible and put it in their pockets. There are other developers that will have predetermined budgets that have been allocated and they have a, a certain rental and a yield. And they realize that by allocating that money wisely, they enhance their buildings for the long term. So developers that are just taking money out with, without a long term commitment, uh, then there's not much you can do, right? You can't really win. When you, when you have a developer that has a longer term view, you can then sit with them and look at the money allocations that are made. You can also, if you, when I said to you earlier that architects need to be the most skilled, okay, in terms of managing the money packages on a job, okay, both you need to understand engineering so you can minimize um, the cost of the engineer in terms of coming up with solutions, and you need to be on top of what things really cost. So you can go into packages on balustrades, you can go into tile finishes, and you can see if you can save money in other areas so that you can take the same pots of money, okay, and spread them in a different kind of way. So that's why I said to you, if you've got a developer who's taking all the money back, there's nothing you can do. But that's not generally the case. Most developers we work with work in a very structured way where there's a pot of money, they want to spend as much as possible to enhance their buildings to get within reason to get a certain return against the rental. And if you work, work with those clients and you you exercise those skills with them, it's not hard to convince to them to 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 spend the money on gardens and other facilities. I mean, if they don't, their buildings just aren't going to fill up. And so when they see buildings next to them filling up because their competitors are going down that that road, then they will be willing to make those changes and spend the money. Yeah. Okay. Graham, does that answer your question? Sorry, I'm not sure. Graham, your, your question? Yeah, thanks. Was... I appreciate it. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. Devin? Hi, Anthony. Thank you Pardon. for uh, the presentation. It was very insightful. I think the first time that you uh, actually lectured me was uh, back in 2013 in my undergrad. So I'm very familiar with your work. Thanks. Um, so... I think it's quite interesting that you mention, you know, diversifying your skills and I'm running my own practice now and I have found that architecture isn't quite enough. Yeah. And I've branched out and diversified into, into Unreal Engine and I oh, found yeah. that, and I've found that Unreal Engine is an amazing tool to, to, to render out your concepts and your ideas. And I've found that you know the physical limitations don't exist within Unreal Engine, and you can create and you can create things that really are out of this world. So my question is, is in terms of where architecture is going and the future of architecture, is with the rise of things like the metaverse and NFTs and digital forms of of architecture, is 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 what what is your insight uh, of 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 what that means for architecture and for architectural students getting involved with things software like this is what is what what could it, what could they do with things like this is just what is your insight uh, so i think uh, we thought we thought about this quite a lot i think that i'm not sure about nfts and, and if they're going to be sustainable for for the long term i think that you can certainly take your architectural skills and, for example, uh, get into animation, okay, and and use Unreal to, whether it's advertising, whether it's make, making movies, um, you can certainly take that creativity and transition it into that kind of industry, whether it's advertising or, or, or the movie industry. I think that um, you could also get into app design and gaming. Uh, in a massive way. Okay, I think mm. um, there's a huge opportunity to take architectural skills with the kind of software you're talking about and transition into into gaming. You could create software where 
uh, in education. So you could, if you were going to go into a virtual VR environment or AR environment, probably an AR environment and put on goggles, and you're going to teach someone um, about things that are physical, you know, physics or science or biology, you can animate those spaces in a different kind of way. So I think there's massive opportunity coming um, mm. next 10 years, okay, for taking architectural skills and looking at maybe not a real built environment, but certainly mm. many, many, many industries that need those skills of modeling. And, and, and so, yeah, in the metaverse, whatever that translates to, is a future. It's really just about the timing, but there's no question that architectural skills will be needed in very different kinds of ways in over the next 10, 15 years, you know, for your mm. generation. That's a, a real reality, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I think that's just a good insight for, for some of the students. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool, so thanks. I, I must agree. I think that is really valuable. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, Ruben? Hi, Anthony. It's good to see you, man. How's it, Ruben? Um, so I just have a question regarding to the running of the practice and what the difference is with, you know, pre and post COVID pitching for work. Um, how does it compare? Are you finding yourself pitching for work you wouldn't usually get? Um, or yeah. Find, and finding and other people pitching for, for like, like international companies coming in. And does it perhaps mean you can pitch for a lot more work than you usually did? Why would you say pitching for more work than we usually did? Just want to understand. No, I'm just that. asking because now, now it's, if it's online, you can, you know, you can run three presentations and, you know, you can run more presentations with your time. You know, I don't think so. I think that, um, you know, we used to do, the, in South Africa at the moment, the environment's changed um, drastically. So, you know, where we used to do three 30,000 square meter buildings in a year, we at the moment, and I think it's going to be like this for the next four or five years, are looking to do, you know, 10,000 square meter buildings. But we've adjusted our, our cost of our business so that the impact's almost the same. So you can be as profitable um, with a smaller building business, uh, whether it's through natural attrition um, or, or whether we had to retrench maybe two years ago, you know. Um, you, you, you're sizing your business to the market. And... Um, I don't think that, you know, we're doing work, um, quite a bit of work in Africa, we're doing work, we pitched on work in Poland, but when you get that work at the end of the day, you can't deliver it. You, you, you don't know the bylaws, you don't know uh, the material. So, you know, you can take an office like Stefan and Tony's office where um, they've been very successful in converting uh, the residential work all over the world, but the only selling phase is, I think stage three, I think, um, or part of stage four. Um, and then they have to get other people to deliver it at the end of the day uh, in those countries. So COVID, I think, uh, there hasn't been, uh, the opportunity for us as a practice is that we've had to become more diverse in looking for work. And when the market changes, we're gonna be stronger for it because we're much more diverse in the kinds of range of work we do. But it's certainly not a great environment. It's been incredibly difficult time. For, for architectural practices of any scale in this country. Um, and I don't think that getting work overseas, unless you have a footprint in that country with people to deliver it, is, is viable really in the, in, in, in the longer term, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Ruben. Okay, and then the last, last uh, question from uh, Tamale. Good evening, Anthony. Um, firstly, thank you so much for your presentation. It's been very insightful. Pleasure, my question, yeah, my question is actually, um, you dealt with the current practices that I've had to adapt, and you did mention something or two for the young graduates. I'm coming in for the 35 year old, that two man, one man and woman practice. How would you advise them to be commercially viable in a tough environment, let's say adv advising yourself in like when you were beginning your practice all those years ago? I, th I think you, you've got to make a decision about 
what kind of architectural practice you want to be and where you get your work from. So I'm going to answer this in a roundabout way. There are very brave architects like Jeremy Rose, uh, very talented architects who made a living from competitions, right? So that's that's a route. You have this very strong sense of um, yourself as a designer, and you go out and you get a lot of, say, government competition work uh, in South Africa. And he's had an incredibly, or well, he had an incredibly good career in that space. Um, as a single practitioner, you know, it's hard because it's hard to get people to give you that first break. And um, I think that if you're doing houses um, as a young practice, you're very exposed to to the whims of the market, right? It's, and, and maybe um, that's where you need to start. But ultimately, you want to try and get work from people that when you form a relationship, that relationship is sustainable because their job is to build buildings. And so very early on when we started our practice, I didn't want to go to a client and build a relationship and they finished that house and then you never, there was no follow on or you're, you're hoping there was word of mouth and they spoke to somebody and the timing was good and you just happened to get a house from their friends, right? That's very, very difficult space. Um, if you go and you focus on developers that develop on a continual basis, even if they're small, um, that would be a place to start. You know, people who develop housing, three, four houses or clusters, because you need to work with people whose business is to build. Um, and then I think you can find some stability as an architect and from that point grow your business outwards. Very, very hard. To, and it doesn't matter if you're one or two person practice. There are developers who are small, um, that would be grateful to be working with, with people who focused on them and make them the most important person. Um, so you don't have to go, it'd be very hard to get work from a redefinable growth point, but you, but it's a journey. So you start off with guys who are developing houses or one office block. You need to do research and find out who those people are and approach them. But it's consistency of development that drives the stability of the practice. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, I think that brings us to the, the end of this evening's presentation. Anthony, thank you very much for your insights and your patience um, and for answering some very, very, um, a, a lot of questions, but I think with by providing great insight into what is happening in the profession and where we're going to. And I can only agree with you about the, the importance of developing your creativity and looking at, at other means of uh, diversifying. Yeah. Um, so from from my side, thank you very much. Um, and thank you also to all everybody who attended. Um, we hope you found the presentation um, useful and of value to you. And I trust that it will be of value to you in your career. Um, and then also thank you to the GSA staff and everyone else involved um, in the marketing and setting up the meeting. Thank you very much. And guys, thank, thank you. you I just thank everybody for, for attending. I really appreciate it. And Christo, for the opportunity of, uh, of, of speaking tonight and engaging with everybody. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. So everyone uh, who'd like to find, get the CPD points, um, please email me. Patricia has um, placed in the chat my email, so you can find me there and just um, ask for your CPD points there. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.